done extremely good, uh, they have extremely good tenure and career. Uh, they belong to the domain right from education, industry, arts, culture and so on and so forth and therefore PIC is a very active platform which has multiple uh, programs in terms of uh, lectures, seminars, uh, conferences, debates, uh, discussions which keep on going throughout the year. PIC Adda is one of the verticals in which uh, we have uh, uh, lectures uh, which are conducted once every month. Along with this, PIC is also involved in writing policy papers in different domains. Side of PIC that is uh, Pune International Center or not watching. Recently, as we all know, uh, just a couple of weeks back, we had this G20 summit which uh, recently concluded uh, in New Delhi. And there was one of the major takeaway, uh, which was the Global uh, Biofuel Alliance, which was formed. And this has been a very big news, and uh, India is uh, set to gain a lot uh, from this particular alliance. Uh, we all know this, but we may not know the details very. And therefore, we thought that this is an extremely timely event uh, that we can have to understand what is this uh, Global uh, Biofuel Alliance and what goes uh, under it and what is the way in which India can be uh, have, can have an advantage from this particular alliance. So, uh, I think we all are eager to learn what this alliance brings to our own country. For this, we have an extremely good speaker today, today with us. Uh, he is presently, presently the Vice President uh, of Corporate Strategy of Praj Industries Limited. As an Electronics and Telecommunications Engineer by training, Dr. Peter holds a doctoral degree in International Marketing Strategies from SPPU, Pune University. In his career spanning over three decades, Dr. Peter has worked for leading Indian and multinational companies in, pro uh, in product as well as project businesses. Widely traveled around the world, Dr. Rudhika specializes in formulating and implementing business transformation strategies. Passionate about education, Dr. Rudhika <coughs> has long-standing associations with several renowned institutions around the world. He holds honorary positions in various industry associations, institutions and professional bodies such as CII, Pune Management Association, COEP, Tech University and Marathi Vijayan Commission. Just to name a few. He has published several research papers in journals and regularly writes columns on diverse topics in newspapers. So, we have a very good speaker with us today. He is also closely connected to MCCI, and therefore, for him, most of the crowd is not new. Uh, so, we welcome you, uh, Dr. Ravindra, for this platform. Okay. Um, very good evening to all. Uh, I want to start off by thanking Amitabh, sir. For, uh, for an opportunity to present a topic that's very contemporary. In many ways, coming to PIC is like coming to your home. Dr. Pramod Chaudhary, also founder member of PIC. And uh, I must also thank him for encouraging me to take up this uh, very enthusiastically. <laughs> of course, nice to meet Abhay once again at another forum. Sangeeta, thank you for all this generous introduction. And so many familiar faces, uh, perhaps... Uh, if I start thanking each one of them, <laughs> uh, it will be a while. But uh, I think this topic is very, very exciting and very opportune too, I think, like Sangeeta said. Uh, so in next about 40 minutes or so, uh, we would di dive deeper into this topic. The way I have structured this uh, presentation is... Uh, how do you... Yeah, yeah, so, okay, so you had just a, okay, you had just a screen. So what's the matter? No, no, but slideshow mode, okay, it's already there. It doesn't show here. Okay, it doesn't show slideshow mode here, but I think that's fine. So, uh, the way I have a... Not moving. It should move now. So how do you do this? 
It's not moving here. Want to put up my computer? Yeah. Now this is good. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Sorry about the technical snack. So. Uh, the way I have structured, so the topic of my presentation is uh, biomobility, reimagining transportation sector and why um, we are going to dive deeper into this. The way I have structured this discussion is uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about climate change and we'll see how they are related. We're going to talk about energy transition, again, extremely hot topic, uh, which is being spoken almost every day, no matter what part of the world. Uh, uh, what newspaper you read, there will be a talk about climate change and um, energy transition and those are the rational as to why we should reimagine biomobility. And then for the next three sections, we are going to look at bioeconomy of which biomobility is a subset. And then we are going to look at the mobility canvas as a whole. And then eventually we look at what is that that Praj or we are doing in this space to actually reconfigure the mobility for for the larger good so um, the pictures here tell you a story last year was marred by extreme climate cam calamity events across all continents whether it is floods hurricane heat waves wildfires droughts we had everything so earlier in july when Antonio Guterres addressed the UN gathering, he said that the era of climate change is over. What we are entering now is an era of global boiling. So climate boiling. So he says we have crossed actually a stage and there was a reason why he said that. July 17th was recorded as the as the temperatures of July 17, 17.6 degrees centigrade was the highest ever average global temperature recorded in the history. Sometime in July, there is a place called Death Valley in the borderline of Nevada and California where the temperatures as high as 53.6 degrees were recorded, which was the second highest ever recorded. So clearly July was the hottest month on the record. And that's where he said these remarks. And as if those remarks were to be justified, August hasn't been any different. Just the recent report of World Meteorological Organization said that the highest <clears throat> average temperature recorded on the ocean is 21 degrees, which is again the new watermark. And August is by far the highest, uh, you know, average global temperature. So, and it could as well go 2023 as surpassing what we saw in 2022. The underlining message here is the climate calamities are increasing day by day. And just to underline the point, this slide actually tells you that if you look at the last two decades of previous millennium and compare them with the first two decades of this millennium, there is a substantial rise in climate calamities. And what does that mean? Economic losses, infrastructure setbacks, loss of human life and whatnot. So clearly we are seeing that the dangers of climate change are not just at our doorstep, but they are already inside. What's even more alarming is that uh, estimated some $5 trillion or even more, the figure must be even more, Economic damage was caused in last 50 years. While most of the economic damage was in the developed nation, 9 out of 10 human lives lost were in developing nations. So we are hit even badly. So we got to do something about it. And there are so many nations which are vulnerable. India after the G20 summit has emerged as a voice of global south which are more vulnerable in terms of economies, population, to all of that. So this actually underlines the importance. So no matter what forum, whether it is the COP summit that was concluded in Egypt last year, or whether it was the G20 summit throughout 
we had to have, have we have had several rounds of meetings over 60 cities so many delegates came here and discussed on variety of topics or whether it was world economic forum at davos one theme resonated everywhere is about climate calamities and about the risks that are because of the climate change and the calls for net zero are getting louder and louder and this net zero call was first given at a Glasgow summit a couple of years back, COP summit in Glasgow, it repeated in Egypt. Now we are just at the foothills of COP summit that is happening in Dubai in November, end November, early December. So clearly you have to go net zero, which means you have to cut the greenhouse gas emissions. And that's what brings us to the next topic. What is energy transition doing in this regard? So again, there are four surefire pathways to achieving net zero. Clearly, we need to do more forestation. We have to stop deforestation. We have to conserve the plantation because they are actually, as we studied, they have the largest carbon bearing capacity. So we cannot afford that our forest cover is eroding. And you know, the wildfires in Amazon or in the other parts of the world is actually a very, very bad news for overall climate uh, thing. Then there is circular economy, reduce, reuse, recycle, replenish, replace, repurpose. So keeping the goods in circulation as far and as wide as possible, and which is actually a clarion call gave our prime minister gave at the Glasgow summit, which is life, lifestyle for environment, which is actually moving away from mindless consumption to mindful and deliberate utilization. So moving away from consumption, because it is amply established in research and scientific studies that in our pursuit of GDP growth, infrastructure development, we've been consuming energy mindlessly, which is actually resulting in uncontrolled emissions, which is again leading to global warming and eventually climate change and then to climate calamities and to economic losses and to human losses and it's a vicious circle. So somewhere we have to slow it down if we can stop it. And that's why these four pathways to get to net zero or curbing the greenhouse gas emissions come in. There is a technology called carbon capture and storage which is under development, still expensive, but technology has the solution in it that you can actually capture carbon and actually do a sequence station. But what's of interest to us is actually transiting to cleaner, greener energy sources. So which is what this whole business of energy transition is all about. And this is certainly a controllable variable for us. So what is all this about? So this energy transition, again, no matter which part of the world, which forum, there are enough research and studies and clarion calls given for expressing SOS need to graduate to cleaner and greener energy sources, which is actually an energy transition. And that's our best bet to limit the global temperature rise. And that's why energy transition is more important. And let's look at what this energy transition is about in a little bit more detail. So historically, energy transition has happened twice. Our ancestors used to use biomass for cooking their food and other needs before we actually struck the coal discovery. And then coal was in circulation for decades altogether before we actually had this oil strike. And then slowly we went on to the oil economy using crude oil and oil derivatives for, a, for our energy needs. And it's a combination of coal and oil that actually dominates the energy landscape. Which is also one reason why we know that there are greenhouse gas emissions. Because as this coal and oil are actually deposited beneath the earth surface, there is already carbon there in the atmosphere. But what we are doing in tapping the fossil fuel resources is actually extracting this carbon which is beneath the earth surface, consuming it and burning to create more carbon which adds to the 
existing atmosphere and that is why you have more and more carbon emissions which are ever rising and that's why we are now looking at the third energy transition which is what is getting discussed actively no matter which forum which is about moving to clean and green energy sources so let's keep going forward to see what those clean and green energy sources are and if you look at this clean energy sources solar is well known uh, it's actually commoditized so much to the extent that you know the new upcoming residential complexes commercial complexes have mandate to put solar panels as a part of this countries like india tropical countries are blessed with ample of sunshine so there is so much to harness solar energy wind is obviously well known not all countries are blessed with wind because wind again as we know is god's gift wind is basically nothing but movement of air from the low pressure area high pressure areas to low pressure areas and why that happens because earth is full of water surface and land and because of the sun it gets unevenly heated as a result you have this pockets of high air density and low air density and then so you have ample wind in some countries and not wind as a resource let's say for example in middle east or some of those countries so solar and wind is well publicized hydro is a fantastic resource but again limited by the geographical constraints nuclear power is one of the cleanest forms of energy there is a lot of debate going on and while the western world has actually tried to move away from nuclear power india's energy mix has very nominal portion of nuclear power and there are big ambitions 10 gigawatt four plants envisaged which are also facing some resistance but we have ample opportunity to grow in that area then obviously there is geothermal again not commercially exploited as much as it could and then there is tidal green hydrogen is still ushering on the horizon how to make it techno commercially feasible but again we go back to the bio energy which is everywhere which is waiting to be capitalized which is waiting to be harnessed there are technologies which are today able to very effectively capture the energy in the biological form and which is what brings us to the next topic of bioeconomy and let's go there little bit so what is bioeconomy it's a knowledge based economy that harnesses the biological feed stocks in basically carbohydrates and these feed stocks are undergoing biochemical biothermal processing and then we have various types of derivatives coming in the form of fuels in the form of materials chemicals so it's a knowledge based economy and the best part is it is in circular in nature unlike hydrocarbons which are beneath the earth surface carbohydrates are above the earth surface and we all studied in physics or biology or chemistry or sciences that plants absorb carbon dioxide and they release oxygen so which by very design suits to this whole business of curbing the greenhouse gas emissions because plants absorb carbon dioxide goods and products made from plants when consumed emit carbon dioxide so in a way you have what we call as a car low carbon or carbon neutral cycle so the whole circularity is built in into the bio economy and here we are not damaging planet earth irrevocably because this is a renewable thing you know we are blessed with this cycle so i think this is a resource waiting for us to be capped and why bioeconomy is important is for other reasons as well you know united nations have this uh, goal 17 sustainable development goals which are to be achieved by 2030 and as many as 11 of this 17 goals bioeconomy resonates resonates or it cuts across so the minute we harness this we are also inching forward in our efforts to become more sustainable so bioeconomy is unprecedentedly important now that's 
basically a rational as to why it is important to see how we can harness bioeconomy. Now talking about mobility, you see industry and transportation are number one and two consumers of energy and they are also the top emitters of greenhouse gases. And these are more or less hard to abate sectors, you cannot do without them. Then how you can best manage them is the question and that brings us to the mobility part. So if you look at the mobility landscape, over the centuries mobility also has evolved by going from steam engines to fossil fuel based engines and now from fossil fuel based engines to coming to a new form of transportation which is in the form of electric vehicles, hydrogen powered vehicles or biofuel powered vehicles. So we are also seeing that transition happen. So the mobility landscape is also evolving. If we look, come back to India and say look at the air transportation, road transportation or sea transportation, we have a long long way to go. Mobility is important for the movement of people, goods, services because the consum generation centers and the consumption centers are not same. So they have unprecedentedly important role. And what this slide actually tells you that we have still a lot to achieve whereas the growth is staggering, exponential, we are going to go only northwards. So if mobility is going to go that much northwards, we got to do something, that's why it is called hard to abet sector. That's why we got to do something about it so that we don't actually slow down the evolution of mobility that actually helps to further the cause of economy livelihood, social development, inclusive growth, but we also care about environment. So the end game or end objective is to strike a fine balance between people, planet and profit, economy and environment. And that's where we are looking at developing some solutions. And clearly if we focus on the road transportation, automobile or auto ancillary industry is one of the largest industries in India. Be it employment generation, be it uh, foreign direct investment, be it livelihood, supply chain, uh, you name it and we have seen it that it contributes handsomely to the national growth. And India is about to emerge as second or third or, two, or second largest automobile producer, whether it is two-wheelers, four-wheelers, commercial vehicles. So this landscape is very important and it is also considered as a barometer of economy. So if automobile industry is doing well, economy is doing well. Why? Because clearly there is an economic activity that actually ensures mobility of people or goods and services. So this mobility sector is very important. So how is this mobility sector today? Clearly IC engines are workhorse of the industry. They have been proven, they have been in use for century or more, unfailing, technology is established, safety is in place. Nothing actually comes in the way of efficiency and effectiveness of internal combustion engines. But what brings with this is actually some things that we don't want to know and hear and see. A country like India which is extremely dependent on the imported sources of fossil fuel, crude oil, liquefied natural gas, we are paying heavily in terms of foreign exchange. That bill is not negotiable. So our import bill, so to say, is only going to go northwards. And our export bill, is we are not able to match for any reason, then the current account deficit is going to grow. When current account deficit is growing, the economy is on weak wicket. It adversely affects the currency. We have to retort to debt and several other things. So it has a detrimental effect on the economy. Effect on the environment is all well known. I mean the statistics and studies have shown that the deaths because of the respiratory diseases 
attributable to the emissions far outweigh any other cause of death and still we are not able to negotiate this challenge effectively so that's another area we need to look into and uh, clearly you know we are seeing very much in our own city of pune that the pace of infrastructure development is always ahead so no matter how much you create infrastructure the traffic congestions are becoming order of the day the commute is becoming increasingly difficult so some of these challenges are there so what do we do about it so there are solutions available and then again the left hand side clearly tells you that india is not alone in this journey this problem is universal western world traffic jams are just as much as they are in our part of the world so we all collectively need to develop new mobility solutions and that is why we need to reimagine the mobility and there are three pathways to actually rediscover this mobility clearly electric vehicles which has a flavor of the season so much in discussion there are so much so many policies uh, to promote electricity based vehicles that are that are in there we are going to talk about bio mobility or bio based mobility then we are also going to look at the combination of that so clearly electric vehicles uh, are here to stay there are so many um, you know uh, models that are launched two wheeler landscape is evolving very fast people are banking on the low opex of these uh, low operational expense of this uh, electric vehicles and they have certain advantage they have no tailpipe emissions the uh, air air quality is not affected as much uh, minimum moving parts compared to the ic engine so you know there, there are lots of merits to the electricity driven vehicle low in maintenance uh, what not the list can go on but what it also brings with it are some set of challenges which aren't getting talked as much as they should be and those challenges are by no means any small it will be a big challenge what to do with this toxic waste at the end of life cycle with with the batteries how to dispose electron uh, e waste is a big challenge there is range anxiety we have all known that uh, when the batteries are new they function efficiently as you go by their life drops charging infrastructure need to be developed foremost important is what is the source of electricity that actually powers this electric vehicles in a country like india which is again about we may have fantastic capacity built up of renewables but when it which is in the form of kw uh mw and gw when it comes to actual utilization which is kilowatt hour megawatt hour gigawatt hour even today 60 to 65% or as much as 70% of the electricity generated is still from fossil fuels which means we will end up cleaning our backyard but we will continue to pollute somewhere else which doesn't help environment because this is a global problem and we are all into this game together it's like saying that we are riding in a boat but the hole is not drilled beneath my seat ultimately wherever the hole is in the boat the water ingush will happen it will sink all of us so i think that's one of the challenge that we are going to talk about still the life cycle is not complete the replacement cost of batteries and we can talk but this is not a topic of electric vehicles that brings us to this bio mobility the whole concept of bio mobility revolves around the fact that it utilizes a renewable energy feedstock which is agricultural or carbohydrate based feedstock we utilize that biological or agri agricultural feedstock we process it through the biochemical biothermal processes and actually what we get is a low carbon biofuels and this bio mobility has very traditional biofuels advanced biofuels some of those biofuels are next generation and some of them are future fuels and clearly you can see the green band has been there it's well established it's working the blue band is actually what we are seeing now whereas the orange one is actually where the future lies 
So no matter what is the form of mobility, whether it is trans surface transport, air transport or marine transport, there are biofuels that have solution to it. And we today have technologies that can do this very efficiently, very effectively. So they have started competing on a parity. So biomobility is actually nothing but production of low carbon biofuels using agricultural feedstock that actually curbs the greenhouse gas emissions. And why? Because biofuels typically have rich percentage of oxygen that helps when blended with fossil fuels, it helps the complete combustion, which means that there is lower particulate matter from the tailpipe emissions, which means lower health hazards and lower greenhouse gas emissions. So that's, that's biomobility for you. And how is government of India harnessing this biomobility? Extremely proactively, very progressively. We have very, very groundbreaking policies in the form of national biofuel policy, which allows us to expand a range of feedstocks, not just from sugar cane, but also to starchy and lignocellulose, which is biomass. There are policies that actually help propagate the Compressed biogas, which is a cousin of compressed natural gas, but coming through biological route. And these policies actually are so progressive that in last decade, we have, as you can see from the graph, done extremely well to harness the ethanol blending percentage, which has hit a 10% mark ahead of its target. And the government has actually advanced 20% blending considering that it is helping economy, ecology, society and overall 360 degree development. So progressive government policies has a big role in propagation of biofuels. And obviously this aligns with several flagship programs because it is our own land, it is our own agriculture, it is our own production and beneficiaries are our, are our own people. India is blessed with ample of sun land and agriculture. It's just that we need to harness this strength to be able to derive maximum benefits out of these resources. And the next slide therefore tells you that something called flex fuel vehicles is on ushering on the horizon. So up to 20% blending of ethanol in the gasoline doesn't call for any radical changes in the internal combustion engine. Nothing on the material of construction, nothing on the engine design. The minute you go upwards of 20%, there is some technology changes, there are some changes in the internal combustion engine, which is the technology which is very much prevalent in America, in Brazil, with all the major OEMs that are operational in India. So these flex fuel engines are actually capable of working with the higher blend percentage up to 85% and obviously they are able to function more in a more eco-friendly way at a lower cost because uh, uh, you know we are reducing the import dependency of our nation. We are able to generate more captively and this technology is very much established and it's there. So flex fuel engines are already unveiled. They are actually going to come in the market. In fact, Honorable Minister Gadkari ji often speaks about mandating OEMs, whether it is Toyota, General Motors, Ford, Volkswagen. I mean, you name the co company, they have this technology. They've been using that technology. What you see outside uh, India, especially in America or Brazil, is there is a differential pricing, which means the benefit of ethanol blending and lower prices is passed on to the customer. Sooner than later, this trend will also come to India. There was already talk in the last budget of levying a blending tax, <coughs> which will eventually get affected. Unleaded, unblended fuel will attract tax. And that's the way we will go ahead. So I think this is the one example as to how biomobility can kick in. 
but you know if we don't want radical changes of uh, just as we don't want to move from internal combustion engine directly to evs hypothetically speaking that would mean disaster same way we also don't want to move from <coughs> complete petrol engines to complete ethanol engines so there is something in between which is a flex fuel hybrid which is actually a coexistence coexistence where you are actually using a rich blending of ethanol with gasoline and you also have electric battery pack which actually is an on board charging possible because of the combustion of the fuel so this combines the benefit of petrol and ethanol and that's why you have this what they call as a strong hybrid electric vehicles and such vehicles are there on the display at the delhi auto expo earlier this year minister gadkari had inaugurated this and just last month uh, he actually unveiled another toyota innova high cross these cars have a huge 6688 months waiting time but the technology is there it is coming to it is already in india it is picking up when actually a market leader who is a trend setter sees the success we are very assured that this will be emulated or there will be so many companies which are getting into this domain so this combines at the best best of both worlds so that's again one way bio mobility can help us so just to quickly summarize if you look at various parameters here and start comparing conventional mobility what is favorable what is unfavorable what is conditionally favorable you see the carbon emissions which is actually tail pipe emissions we are talking of infrastructure development what is infrastructure development so it is about uh, for instance fuel dispensing stations gas stations very much existing because they have been there perpetually but electric infrastructure for charging is yet to get established employment generation we just saw the statistics that automobile industry has thousands of parts so not just oem but there is a huge supply chain of auto component players which auto ancillary industry auto component industry which is a huge employment generator and revenue spinner not just that they have after market also a big roadside mechanics and all that the minute you go to electric uh, vehicles there are fewer parts fewer components needed so we'll have massive disruptions in the supply chains of auto component industry which may adversely impact us so that's again is about employment whether the policy needs to be there it needs to be there till the industry that that has to become self sustainable although we are saying conventional not mobility is not policy dependent the taxation is pretty much the part of the policy making in fact those tax revenues coming from petroleum products was the one which subsidized all this vaccination for indian millions of indians and probably millions living internationally technology again establishment is another factor we have not seen yet a complete full life cycle of electric vehicles what happens to it midway and afterwards we have often had experience that our laptop or computers at the beginning when it is brand new the battery lasts for 3 hours as it was promised actually as it ages we see that the battery backup doesn't sustain earlier generation of electric vehicles also have had this problem there is a lot of research going we are not trying to be critical of what has happening in the electric mobility but these are practical problems range anxiety related issues we have also yet to see sustained and assured supply of electricity as we leave our suburbs and towns and go to the villages and rural parts where charging station is still far from a reality or the quality of power is still is in question uh inclusive growth whether you know it creates employment generation it harnesses other sections of society environmental issues we spoke foreign exchange we spoke and if we add the bio mobility you see lots of green coming in there the reason is simple when you are harnessing bio mobility you are actually harnessing the farming community which is by and large living in the rural economy because you are giving farmers alternate revenue stream in addition to the harvested crop they can sell their agricultural waste and create another revenue stream 
by and large the bio fuel plants are located near to the feedstock near to the farmland which means by locating bio refineries near the farming community in rural parts of india you are actually helping create a source of employment entrepreneurship for those people that also will positively impact the grave problem of rural to urban migration and the city infrastructure already getting stressed so a decentralized self sustaining bio refineries where the farmers after harvesting actually sell the stubble or agricultural waste to these bio refineries the rural youth gets opportunity to work in these bio refineries the rural youth also gets entrepreneurship opportunities to be biomass aggregator storage and some kind of operations and maintenance so some entrepreneurship opportunities the biofuels produced from that decentralized plant actually helps tank the tractor and all the automobiles for those farmers then and there and actually emissions are minimized so you are talking about a self sustaining decentralized bio refineries and a web or the big network of those biofuel plants or compressed bio gas plants as many as 5000 of them was envisaged in the earlier satat policy this government again has in the last budget has given emphasis to compressed bio gas plants and you must be reading newspaper that are running headlines after headlines that many many go global conglomerates energy majors are entering the compressed biogas space and investing heavily in compressed biogas clearly their hydrogen also can come from the biological route today green hydrogen is by and large people recognize it with the hydrolysis from water but that's not classically green green you can actually make green hydrogens strictly from biological route so there is a lot of opportunity there so biomobility benefits everybody as a whole and coexistence in today's times is important so that you don't in our effort to accelerate adoption of cleaner technologies we don't end up disrupting what is already working very well there is something very interesting i read that in the western world is which is energy surplus for them to actually do energy transition they have to either abandon the existing fossil fuel plants or disband them or destroy them and set up new clean green facilities i mean it's what a waste because these refineries these nuclear plants these thermal plants have decades of life cycle and you are abandoning them midway what a big loss of public money compare that to india where we have this huge need and we already have some baseline so the top up part we can do through renewable energy in other words we don't have to destroy our existing fossil fuel plants to be able to comply with nationally determined contributions that every nation is committed as per cop paris climate change summit and what a big advantage it is because abandoning billions of dollars of oil fields gas based stations coal based stations is utter waste and i think that's a big plus so we do not want to disrupt anything we want to coexist and that's why this whole business about coexistence of different and in a, in a country like in india which is already energy starved every piece of energy whether it is coming from biological route wind route solar route tidal route is welcome so we don't want to do something at the expense of something so we have this opportunity to redraw our energy mix energy landscape by only topping up our renewable energy component without destroying so i think that's the major part i wanted to underscore 
and then quickly talking about the pras that i company i represent uh, uh, our company is over four decades old the largest company in the industrial biotechnology space uh, our founder promoter dr pramod choudhary is recipient of many glorious top of the line awards uh, of this industry whether it is george washington carver who in the 19th 18th century actually redefined the whole landscape for agricultural community by innovating various products from the agricultural sources so technology agriculture innovation entrepreneurship science that combination of enterprising nature doc brought dr george washington carver all the global honors and today's times people who have extraordinary contributions to this agriculture entrepreneurship innovation and science are recognized through this award and dr choudhary became the first recipient of this award first indian recipient of this award so the company has glorious track record of having supplied the bio economy or technologies in the bio industrial biotechnology space to over 100 nations around the world our philosophy in bio economy is based on the two pillars what we call as bio mobility which is uh, renewable transportation fuel for all modes of transportation that is low carbon in nature which helps decarbonize hard to abate transportation sector and then there is bio prism which is a portfolio of technologies for production of renewable chemicals and materials which actually are substitute for the traditional chemicals which are more environment friendly less toxic not poisonous which actually help recycle the carbon because again they are coming from the carbohydrate route instead of hydrocarbon route and that's how both result in curbing the greenhouse gas emissions and india we are blessed with uh, several types of feed stock we maharashtra uttar pradesh uh, karnataka are blessed with ample of agricultural i mean uh, sugar cane feed stock and there are derivatives of sugar cane called molasses and then again some quality different qualities of molasses which when harnessed can give us ethanol and again there are different streams of value that you can derive out of this to actually create a uh, bio manure and some of the other things bio bitumen which can be used for other applications so such technology exists several plants are established in india today which actually help us inch closer to fulfilling this ethanol blending mandates and help us move towards the energy security or energy self reliant india by 2047 the vision that our honorable prime minister has so this is a established technology the second generation technology which is a fantastic uh, breakthrough where the farmers in the vicinity of panipat through farmer producing organization sell their agricultural waste and this waste is used as a feed stock for production of second generation ethanol as many of you know the agricultural waste or the agricultural stubble is simply torched in northern parts creating brown brown clouding which actually settles over northern capital and gives a big problem to the air quality and causes a health hazard so this stubble burning is very chronic we are already entering a season where this will start making headlines because the window between for the farmer after harvesting and next cropping is so narrow that they find it easiest to actually torch because they don't know what to do with it so we are now working to create awareness we are working as a to develop a resilient ecosystem to actually help farmers sell that agricultural waste there are agri bio aggregators which are getting forming a stable supply chain just imagine hundreds of years back invention of coal mines capital investment of developing mines capital investment of setting thousands of kilometers of railway infrastructure to transport that coal from one place to another it took several decades or centuries and that's why we are getting a cheap coal power today this is by bio supply chain because the biotechnology is relatively new entrant this entire 
backward supply chain is still not established. But it is fast getting established thanks to the progressive policies and farmer producing organizations coming in just like a Amul moment that you know marginal uh, farmers just like milkmen having two, four uh, cow. cattle field or cow, cattles or cow. Same way the this can work and make a very resilient supply chain. So this project and there are two other projects that are being built will actually redefine the whole second generation of ethanol technology. And then very recently, just a couple of months back, India first time flew a flight that had a sustainable aviation fuel that was made from Indian feedstock using Indian technology produced in India to clean Indian skies on a flight that was domestic. And that's a big statement because that's the change that is coming. There are mandates that are coming to the aviation industry that they will have to graduate to sustainable aviation fuel. And aviation being a global industry, the airlines coming from Europe, from America will need a refueling. And can you imagine this can't be done in Middle East? They have no resource. So India has a fantastic opportunity in waking, in waiting to be a hub for refueling of sustainable aviation fuel for the aviation sector. And these mandates are coming. There is a big talk of these mandates coming in there. And then clearly compressed biogas, we spoke about it, farm to wheel as they call it. It's very efficient cycle and that's already happening, that's already you know, this compressed biogas has to feed into the gas pipelines which are being laid by Mahanagar Nigam or Inner Prasa Gas. And that is also, that infrastructure is also being developed. People are able to feed it into the, and just like we get a gas by domestic pipeline at our household, this will also become soon reality. The groundbreaking work is in, in the play as we speak. Such developments take time. But this is certainly one in offering. And, you know, this is where I want to just uh, wrap this up, that bioeconomy is here to stay. It has positive social, economical, and environmental benefits. It helps us to doter or align with big picture where the world is moving, global mandates which have to be complied to, and it actually means developing so solutions which are more sustainable, more environmental friendly, and assures energy security for the generations to come, instead of geopolitizing the generations uh, that are to come. So just to recap, uh, sustainable climate action is an imperative, not a need, but there is no other way to get there. Auto industry is extremely important for the overall growth and development. We have an opportunity today to redefine the transportation sector by deploying the biofuel solutions. Uh, future mobility actually, as I said, can be coexistence so that we don't abandon uh, something that we have already created by our hard-earned money. And actually, it has a positive impact on social economical developments. Thank you for your kind attention and patience. I really appreciate it. Sure. Uh, before we open the, the session for the audience, just one or two quick questions. One is that uh, we always hear this debate about uh, food versus biofuel. Yeah. So, uh, so how do you think that uh, you know food quantity quality will be affected uh, because of? Oh, okay. Yeah, okay, uh -huh. got it. Huh. Huh. So how do you think that, do you think that uh, the production of food will also be altered or it will be lessened or it will be compromised uh, because of the biofuel production? So the answer is N O no because you know uh, if you look at what is happening, so India has variety of feedstocks. So we are talking about uh, making biofuels from A 
sugar cane crush derivatives. So after making sugar, in fact, this, this can be a long answer, but just to recap, sugar industry is already suffering because of sugar glut. There are about 10% of Indian uh, agricultural farming is on sugar cane. Consumption of sugar worldwide is on a decline. The production of sugar worldwide is on increase thanks to wonderful monsoons. What to do with the sugar? Their sugar go-downs are already full. The international pricing of sugar is very high. So whenever we want to export, the government has to subsidize. The go-downs are running full. So the and that's why Minister Gadkari and everywhere there is a talk that instead of producing sugar, you actually make biofuel. So when it comes to sugar cane, we are not quite compromising the food versus fuel. In fact, we are helping because all these sugar mills get a new lease of life because they have guaranteed takeoff by way of product portfolio diversification. And then there are bio manure and other things. Second, we are saying that from the starchy feedstock, you make biofuels, but that starchy feedstock is in the form of spoiled grains, rotten grains, broken, which are not fit for human consumption. So again, there are ample records and statistics to show that India doesn't, food corporation of India doesn't have enough go-downs to store, pu store pulses. They are absolutely rotted and wasted. And that is why this waste to wealth initiative. Third is we are saying lignocellulose, which is actually a waste, which we are torching. So you are actually using the waste and making fuel wealth out of it. So all these three do not compromise a uh, food versus fuel debate at all. And lastly, India has not yet gone the energy crop way, which actually can trigger that instead of mating food crops, are you, which is what is done in Brazil. Brazil has energy crops, which are more high yield crops, high in, um, you know, content. So genetically that could genetically modified. So India has not gone that path. So our policymakers are very progressive, very cognizant of some of these dangers. So the policy is drafted very, uh, what shall I say, diligently to ensure that there is at no point in time food versus fuel debate can arise in Indian context. Thank you. One, one, only one last question that uh, you mentioned something about COP28, which is scheduled in December. Yes. So how do you think that India can use the leverage of G20 now and use it as we go ahead towards uh, this uh, November, December? Uh, that's a brilliant question. So, you know, India, Brazil and America are one of the top uh, biofuel producing nations and they came together. And with their help, this Global Biofuel Alliance was actually launched by Honorable Prime Minister. What that alliance is supposed to do is it is going to give technology collaborations, partnerships, expertise, helping make conducive policy frameworks. There are so many energy starved nations, especially if you look at the tropical countries. And the best part about G20 was last minute inclusion of African into the whole G20 thing. And Africa has ample of sugar cane. And you know, uh, Interestingly, what Indian businessmen did in 1950s to Africa, which is go there, set up sugar mills, bring the expert labor and actually help them scale up uh, their local production of sugar cane and making sugar locally, they can do the same thing in ethanol space. Yeah. And all this while helping ecology, while helping curb greenhouse gas emissions, while helping move towards fulfillment of nationally determined contributions, while staying en route to the net zero path. So the COP28 summit where the calls for net zero will get only louder, Global Biofuel Alliance will have a big role to play. And that's where India is a big lever because we may not be capacity-wise as big as Brazil or America, but technologically we have fantastic technologies. Manpower which is skilled and ready to work so I think we have a big lever, policies which are very crafted to suit the conditions. So some of this playbook that India has done can be borrowed and so many energy starved nations which actually have ample of biological reserves can benefit. And India, which is being spoken as a voice of South, 
which is a club of underdeveloped nations who are depending on the technology, depending on the expertise, the manpower has a big role to play in hand holding and we have done it at the time of vaccine thing. We can do this again to help, rise, help these nations rise and become energy self-sufficient or at least start taking steps in that regard. So COP28 is just the right platform. India's voice has been very loud and clear. We have a big lever in those negotiations as we have seen in Glasgow summit, as we have seen in uh, uh, Egypt summit. And I think in the Dubai summit, there will be yet another India occasion where the Global Biofuel Alliance will come for discussion. Thank you, thank you. We really hope for a great time. Ahead. Absolutely. Uh, questions from the audience? So, it, uh, like I said, it is not this or that, right? It can be this and that. We all have to think um, of collaboration, of partnerships, of coexistence. So, why this versus that? It can be both, right? And in carbon, you are already benefiting. And, and net, net, all of us, what all of us want is to reduce the carbon footprint, to reduce the greenhouse gas emission, to move accelerated to accelerate our journey towards net zero it doesn't matter what the pathways are everything is welcome we are not saying biofuels is the only solution but biofuels is emerging as a very strong proposition because there are so many tropical countries which are blessed with great agricultural resource and that can be harnessed i mean look at all tropical countries africa south america Ample of vegetation, ample of forest, ample of sun, land, all that is undercapitalized. So I think biofuels has a distinct place and we don't think we are in a space or biofuels is not in a space where it is stepping on someone's turf, where it's stepping on someone's toe. We are just saying that biofuels is an idea whose time has come. And uh, Honorable Minister um, Puri Ji, Honorable Prime Minister have spoken time and again, and also uh, Bupendra Yadavji have spoken time and again a big role biofuels can play in helping us achieve sustainable climate actions. So I'm not very fond of debate this versus that. I like this and that. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Uh, you touched upon agriculture and waste, etc. But uh, you did speak uh, or you didn't, uh, did you avoid the topic of uh, municipal waste, you know, which can be converted into bioenergy, etc.? That's a great question. I did not avoid. So compressed biogas uh, can also be made from municipal solid waste. The challenge is this, that municipal waste is not aggregated. You need people who can aggregate it. You cannot use the municipal waste exactly the way it is to be able to put into the processing. So that adds some processing cost, aggregation cost, supply chain cost, which make, which affect the techno commercial feasibility and viability. So if you list down the things, there is enough to do in A, B, C, D, then why jump to E and F? So again, my debate is, why are we not doing this? We can also do this. But there is so much to do in this space, which is proven, established, and provides newer headways and pathways. Municipal solid waste, if you study deeper, the, the whole value chain is not established. The whole aggregate uh, collection of municipal solid waste is not very scientific. Unlike it is in Western world, where you dry waste, uh, uh, wet waste, toxic waste, non-toxic waste, you know, so there is a lot of effort in actually carving out a feedstock that can be seamlessly used or harnessed. Or you are adding two, three, four blocks which don't make the techno commercial viability. So if you have 100 rupees on the table, there are very promising claimants which can lead the same pathway, which can accelerate the journey. We are not saying that is not a worthy claimant. That's also West to Wealth classical story. 
but those models need some works need some mass level participation when the individuals agree that i will say no why is plastic ban not being effective it needs participation at a grassroots level and that's why prime minister's clarion call for life lifestyle for environment so if all of us participate days won't be far where municipal solid waste just like bio waste can seamlessly go into bio refineries and you can have compressed biogas or bio derivatives i hope that answers your question sure I don't want to go again this versus that, but Jetropa plant has lower sugar content compared to some of the other crops. Can be harnessed for making biodiesel, sure, it has a higher gestation time. But again, when it comes to technology feasibility, commercial viability, if among the alternatives, you will always go for a path of least resistance. And that's exactly what has happened. And that's exactly why lignocellulosic feedstock has taken a headway ahead of Jetropa. So we are not dismissive about Jetropa as a fertile uh, biological resource for production of biofuels. But it hasn't shown the kind of promise so far with the technology that we have to get to on the efficiency curve, on a productivity curve, on a process curve to overall positively impact the techno commercial feasibility. End of the day, somebody is putting money on the table to make business out of it. You cannot on a commercial scale, on a volume game, keep subsidizing technologies which are not going to be self-sustaining. So the Jetropa story, we are not saying it's over. It is there, it will move forward. The, the research is ongoing uh, in some other pockets and it won't be, there is algae as another feedstock, there is bamboo is yet another feedstock. Everything has sugar in it and all those sugars, how efficiently you are able to derive them, how efficiently you are able to process them, how, how effectively you are able to put it in a value chain, end of the day, it will boil down to financing, it will boil down to equity investment, it will boil down to policies, it will boil down to creating a sustainable backward integration of feedstock. If Jetropa starts scoring on that, days won't be long before it gets there. That's a great question. So the ethanol blending program and India's ethanol blending success story is being widely talked about. So the, when the government uh, brought in 2018 biofuels policy, it, it took into account what uh, Dr. Sangeeta was talking about, feed versus fuel, how we can have an expanded range of feedstocks, how we can create an infrastructure to accommodate uh, more ethanol blending, how we can create gas pipelines, different types of feedstocks, all that was taken care And then eventually, in a couple of years, I think in 2022 or whatever, government came up with a five-year roadmap for ethanol blending program, where Niti Aayog and uh, Ministry of Petroleum did a thorough study as to how, what are the pockets, you know, you, these days you can use the technology to understand where are the rich feedstocks, how they can be harnessed, what are the ideal locations for the plant, how we can encourage farmers to be part of that movement. So all that meant that we have quickly advanced. So if you look at the ethanol blending curve, we were hardly at 3 or 4 percent by the time this government came in. But thanks to all this visionary work, we have climbed to 10 percent very fast. And we are now shooting for 20 percent even at much shorter interval. So like they said, na, for the Indian economy to grow up first trillion took a long time. I don't know, there is a nice story on that. It took decades. Second trillion came quickly, third is even quicker and the next one are already being talked about. Same way. So the blending is going to grow up. So that's doing very well. As for stubble burning, solutions are known. It requires mindset change. It requires awareness. It requires, because there are agricultural equipments that are being made available to farmers so that instead of torching, they can actually plug it and then, so that whole supply chain development of 
creating a sustainable supply from agricultural stubble instead of burning is a mammoth effort because like I said the window between two crops is too less they find it convenient this has been the practice for decades and centuries so to make them move away from it you need to incentivize you need to use carrot and stick both you need to create infrastructure where such storage of agricultural stubble can be kept so it's a holistic view but we are getting there the first plant uh, that was commissioned in this uh, second generation biofuels technology has uh, rice straw, cotton straw, wheat straw, different types of agricultural waste where the grain is separated from the shelf that all shelf is going as a feedstock. So it's happening. Yes, we too are impatient that we need to do it faster. Everything needs to be faster. So I think we'll get there. So solutions are there. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. I mean at the back also. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because the climate change every day we are seeing new examples sure. and you also mentioned. I think Morocco is also another classic. Example. Oh look at what is happening there. I think the biggest uh, horrible uh, you know and the floods in Libya, I think the yeah. pictures are yeah. horrifying. Some twenty thousand is the official number, but you don't yeah. know. Yeah. Yes. So it's all climate calamities. Uh, right. yeah. And then uh, about those uh, waste etc. I think many corporates like Nestle. I think I offer to buy those waste at sure. a good price. And sure. I think if they all combine, I think it can be a good solution. That's a brilliant uh, thought. So, so people like IKEA have said that we will make packaging only from renewable chemicals and materials. So the people, the big boys who have strong war chairs, financial muscle, if they lead the way to change this, this can happen. There's nothing. So technology is there. We need to cross that valley of death where innovation sees commercialization. And that's a team sport. And for the last uh, point from my side, Ministry of Corporate Affairs of SEBI, etc. has yes. come out with a lot of uh, yes. ESG so compliance, yeah. Mm. So all the BSR and other things. BSC. What do you think will be the role of those? Brilliant point again. So ESG guidelines, uh, or I think the thou top thousand companies have to compulsorily file this report. So what are they doing to actually fulfill the environmental obligation? So the example that you gave of Nestle or the 3M that or IKEA we spoke about are actually leaders, are actually pioneers, are actually showing that it can be done. And I'm sure there are a lot of tech companies. Now we are in dialogue with so many companies who actually have, would want to green their fleet because in the ESG compliance, what are the green initiatives you have taken? So maybe they are running buses on fossil fuel. They see electric buses as the low hanging fruit. But for that, maybe they will select wind farms. But tomorrow when biofuels, Minister Gadkari spoke about 100% ethanol fuel stations getting established everywhere. So when that infrastructure happens, many of these people who want to, because this net zero commitment is not just a national commitment, it is also corporations commitment. IOCL has uh, net zero targets, like all the big uh, things. So all the companies that are listed on capital exchanges have to walk the talk to make this happen. If that happens, like all of us in the room who are eternal optimists, that day is not far when we will be able to indeed uh, curb the temperature rise below 2 degrees centigrade. Huh? Take the last question. Okay, sir. The uh, sir, just to understand something more from you, we have spoken here, no? uh, grasped on the various subjects from the various perspectives. What do you see now going for how much amount of takeover involvement, particularly like, you know, from say policy level to big corporate, how do we really know? make engagement to the various stakeholders so that the journey of biofuel also could be accelerated going forward. So what all could be required going forward? Can you just share something? Wonderful point. Like I said, it's a team sport. You need all hands on the deck, right? You need progressive policies, which we have. You need aware consumers. See, I think it's bottoms up and tops down. So you need a combination, right? You need good financing so like you said sir the banks have also obligation they also have ESG compliance so how many green finance exactly there you go so each of the people but then you know like I said you need everybody's participation and that's why how do we do that so there are there are talks there but you know involving a commoner 
it all starts again from education if people are not cognizant of plastic usage if people are not cognizant of there are now apps which can measure your own individual carbon footprint so the if the awareness level goes to that extent change is not difficult but where are we on that scale so everybody would like to point out to other stakeholder but the reality is uh, just just want to just say in a very different context say 2007 8 there was a report by the regulatory committee why finance inclusion was not there but look at in the last 10 15 years we could you know go into kind of vp kind of you know solution yes how do we know kind of out of the box kind of things you know how do we know evolve many things particularly uh, uh, industry kind of kind of things policy kind of things and best practices kind of things how do we you know like combine and you know uh, Accelerate those you know, to exactly you word you use the you, you hit the nail on the head. Accelerate because India is the only nation amongst G20 which is walking the talk when it comes to nationally determined contributions. Yeah, yeah. So we are doing extremely well. We have doubled our renewable energy capacity. We have targets to reach. We are all on course. There is a hydrogen um, new India hydrogen mission that is kicking in. So we are striking the right chords. The whole thing is about acceleration. Acceleration is never easy, no? Or once you accelerate, you want to change further gear. You want to go further. So I think, like I said, it's happening. It's, happening. it's the idea whose time has come. So we'll have to stay with it. I think one in the so back. My last question Thank you. Really yeah. Can... yeah. Sir, good evening. Uh, good evening. Can you recollect that in the mid and early 2000s, uh, hydrogen fuel cells were the talk of the town? Right? Yes. But fortunately, I'll insert that you know, they fizzled out and the emphasis was no longer there on them. Correct. Do you feel that hydrogen fuel cells are, are a terrible future mobility prospect uh, in the future? Like, let's want to take our opinions. No, no, no. I mean, it's very promising. There are FCEVs, uh, you know, uh, fuel cell uh, vehicles which are already coming in. So the thing is, again, the same. How do you make them techno commercially viable? You know, our greatest glory is not ever falling, but rising every time we fall. So we may have not done well in early in the millennium. That doesn't mean we will not do well this time. This time, big money is chasing hydrogen. There are commitments at national level. There are commitments at corporate level. There are commitments at the, I mean, just go to NCL, I think some, uh, Dr. Sangeeta comes from that domain. She knows what kind of groundbreaking research is going on. The whole acceleration is to make them technically more viable, commercially more viable, and to make it affordable. Because unless the technology proliferation happens, it won't go there. So where do you make the volumes kick in? That is the thing. So. Hydrogen and fuel cells is also one definitely very promising technology which is available on the table and I'm sure uh, we will remember this day and time when it can and very often these appear far fetched but when the acceleration happens it can really happen fast. It's a revolutionary tech. And we have seen this for ethanol blending program for, I mean, Vajpai government in uh, early in the millennium first brought in this concept of Swadeshi Indan yeah. under uh, Ram Naik as a petroleum minister. And that experiment was successful, but some of the momentum was lost. And today we have picked the momentum. So somewhere the priorities, somewhere, you know, uh, if the cart is pulled in all directions, it won't move as fast. And this is the problem. We are talking of methanol economy. We want electric vehicles. We want hydrogen. We want biofuels. We want solar. We want wealth. So perhaps our effort is not concerted. That doesn't mean don't do this and do only this. But, you know, we have to do a little bit better alignment. And that's a ever work in progress. You know, like they say, no, the road to success is always working progress. under progress. Thank you. Stop you. You can talk to him at the latest time. Will, uh, so, on behalf of PIC, let me thank you for a wonderful uh, Absolutely, session. Sanjeeva. And it's a pleasure to have you. Thank like, you. thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Ah, yeah. yeah. This one small token of yeah. appreciation. This is a book from. Uh, wow. Can we request Amita sir to also yeah, please yeah, yeah. I, uh, at least for the at yeah, least for the photograph sir. No, no, वो तो करेंगे आप आपके साथ भी एक. Sir, are you?
estudiando. Ah. Come on, Sanjay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it.